trick shot. Satisfied, all preferences catered to. 
if, when confronted by the marvelously variegated array of recreations and pursuits that this great city has to offer, the stranger and the periodical visitor should turn away dissatisfied, imagining that he has failed to discover anything especially suited to his fancy, his mental and physical organism must be sadly askew. It is his fault, and not Chicago's. From now on, and for the next year or so, this mighty city by the lake will swarm with myriads of men and women of all races, tribes, and languages, being brought hither by the great exposition that is destined to be the marvel of all nations. That some of this floating mass will remain here is beyond question. In that case, the population will swell until the two million mark is passed. The two, swell until the two million mark is passed. Chicago men. Shy. Come in, don't be shy. No point in being shy, but you know it. But you know coffee. Uh, until the two million mark is passed, Chicago would reach a population of two million during the first decade of the 20th century. By 1950, the population was a little over 3.6 million. Despite the predictions by Daniel Burnham and Edward Bennett in their 1909 plan of Chicago, that 13.5 million Chicagoans would populate the city by then. Since the mid 20th century, the population has dropped to its current level of roughly 2.7 million. Fantasies of limitless expansion endured well into the 20th century. The decidedly boosterish Chicago, the city beautiful, in 1943 proclaimed that Chicago was, quote, one of the first four cities of the world in population and destined to become the world's largest city by 1968. Two billion mark has passed. And in the proportion that the population increases, so also will increase the attractions of the city that harbors it. It is the purpose of the present work to set forth, in a terse but comprehensive manner, the various sorts of entertainment offered by the coming metropolis. The author... The author, the writer or writers of Chicago by day and night remain unidentified, but we can deduce some things about them based on the cultural framework in which they uh, operated. The publisher, Thompson and Zimmerman of LaSalle Street, would have been under pressure to produce the book almost as quickly as the fair committee itself had to choose sites and architects. And for the record, by the way, that happened in like a matter of months. Everything was very accelerated fast. That's why the fair actually took place a year after the anniversary of the discovery of America. Right? Everything was a little, just like Millennium Park opened in 2004. You know, Millennium begins when we say it begins. Um, Chicago was a major center for printing industry, and 19th century publishers were capable of such feats. The first books about the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, E.J. Goodspeed's History of the Great Fires in Chicago and the West, and Colbert and Chamberlain, Chicago and the Great Conflagration here within mere months of the calamity, albeit in New York City. And we have a lot in this book about New York not being such a bad thing, actually. The wide range of specific knowledge displayed in Chicago by day and night suggests the book was written by either a glib and loquacious Chicago Renaissance man about town, utterly immune to writer's cramp, remember this is pre-typewriter, this would have been handwritten first, um, or by multiple authors working in parallel, each according to his or her own area of expertise. Perhaps one person could be as familiar with the preaching styles of famed Chicago churchmen, the vast variety of theatrical and other entertainments, the reputation of dozens of hotels, bars, and restaurants, the architectural details of famous buildings, notorious crimes, and the strategies of various criminals and neighborhoods as diverse as Little Cheyenne and Lakeview. It seems unlikely, albeit not impossible. Stylistic variations among the prose of some chapters also suggest more than one writer. And I'll stop reading up there. Want to give me more periods? Oh, yeah, we think the book is actually written by a time traveling Rickfield. I think he went back That's right. 25 years ago. Yeah, he's the guy who would know. And there is some information. Um, the Library of Congress credits a book to a guy named Harry Fain. Mm -hmm. Fain? Yeah. Fain. Um, and the only problem with that is there are, there are facts and assertions in the book about having been physically present at certain times when we know this guy wasn't in Chicago. Uh, we suspect that he might have written parts of it, and um, the publisher would have had to credit somebody in terms of who did it for the Library of Congress. So that's why this guy got Library of Congress attribution. But where, where stylistic variations between the different chapters are so radically obvious that we're, we're very confident it's multiple authors. The author, while sufficiently modest to keep his identity a secret, makes bold to assert that no person who scans the pages of this book will be able, after he has done so, to lay claim to ignorance of the means whereby to procure entertainment or solace for such hours of idleness as he may find on his hands during his stay in the city. The present area of Chicago is a fraction over 180 square miles. What its area will be next year or 10 years hence, nobody can predict. For the present, it is sufficient to know that within the area of 180 square miles, there dwells a community, active, energetic, mercurial, 
eager in business and therefore keen in its thirst for recreation outside of business hours. The present work is undertaken in no spirit of levity or thoughtlessness. Its author is a man of the world who, recognizing the desire of the average man to be amused when the cares of business are done, and being fully cognizant of the qualifications of the city in the amusement line, aims to instruct the uninitiated wayfarer in the paths he may follow for the most satisfaction to himself and the greatest benefit to his system. You keep in mind, there's like three sentences on this page that I've just read. It's lots of comments. Uh, if but one reader confesses his indebtedness to this work for enlightenment in the smallest degree its purpose will have been achieved. With renewed assurances, therefore, that the seeker after light upon a great city's manner of amusing itself will not seek in vain, the author makes his bow to the reader and tenders him an invitation to accompany him through the following pages. And, and, um, the following pages, yes, come on through, no worry, guys, tell you. Um, the following pages, the, the book has to do some interesting balancing acts. Um, one of the things about the culture of the 1890s was this kind of Victorian double standard about uh, sexual morality, for instance, which is one of our topics tonight. And you know, any woman who was out in public was presumed to be not an honor prostitute in some way sexually available. Uh, at the same time, there were these red light districts where prostitution flourished openly. Um, the idea behind that being on some level that you know, men were men and they were going to do what they were going to do, and at least we can do is control it a little bit by keeping it in certain designated areas. Um, but at the same time, there's really strict censorship laws. So the word prostitute is never once used in the text. Um, at one point in the bit we're not going to read, they say, you know, women of the class of whom respectable people would refer to think don't exist. It's like, oh, that's a really long way of saying poor. Right? Um, but so they want they to give you directions to places where you can have a good time, a good time being defined largely as scantily clad women in various occasions where there's also liquor served. Um, but at the same time, they will balance that with like there's a whole chapter on churches and synagogues and the great preachers of the city that you can go here, and a chapter on moral things in the city. Um, but they also give you warnings about threats and dangers. And one of the key threats and dangers were adventurousness. And that's the next chapter. All right. Chapter 9, as to adventurousness, this should perhaps have been included under the head of the preceding chapter. For if there are any pitfalls and perils more dangerous than those laid by fair and unscrupulous members of the fair sex, we have yet to be made aware of them. The adventurers of Chicago, however, deserve a brief and exclusive chapter, insomuch as they constitute a separate class, which might with very great propriety be asked to go about labeled with the initials DF, signifying dangerous female. <laughs> Even then, however, it is safe to say they would not want for victims. For there are some men who would run after a pretty woman if they were morally certain that the pastime would lead to their everlasting damnation. The term adventurous is, is applied to women of careless reputation who, being much too smart to endure the ignominious career of professional demi mondains. Adventurous. This chapter outlines three primary methods used by female con artists, and we'll return to them in order. Um, and are crooked prostitutes to make money, in descending order from genteel blackmail to the badger game of the panel room. Just as a con man, which was the chapter, the topic of the previous chapter, presenting an out-of-town visitor with a chance for some easy money requires his mark to cooperate. An adventurous or con woman depends on her victim's sexual desire and vanity to put him in a place where he will pay her off and be robbed. The emphasis throughout the chapter um, on trust, not trusting any woman one meets for the first time in a public place continues the theme of gendered spaces in the city. Women on their own in public were an erotic opportunity and physical threat or both. A demi-mundane, uh, being demimon being the uh, word for nightlife and crime, demi mundane would be any woman in that world from a waitress to an actress to a prostitute. Let me just say this book repeatedly will put things in French because it makes it sound classical. Demi mundane resort to various shrewd schemes to please the unwary. Some of their class work in concert with male partners, and in such cases the selected victim generally becomes an easy prey. The confidence man may be dangerous. The confidence woman, if she be well educated and bright, as well as pretty, is irresistible, except with most hardened and unsusceptible customers. The shrewdest old Granger. Granger, a farmer. The shrewdest old Granger. <laughs> Some of these notes aren't that deep. I'll no, that's that. very <laughs> nice. The shrewdest old Granger of them all, who steers safely through the shoals and traps set for him by male sharpers, will go down like the clover before the sight under a roguish glance, as it were, from, quote, a white wench's black eye, as Mercutio said. 
quoted from Romeo and Juliet, Act Two, Scene Four. Our writer knows her Shakespeare. We think this chapter might have been written by a woman. We call us crazy. There is no mortal man in this universe of ours, be he never so homely or ill-favored, who does not cherish in his heart of hearts the impression that there is a woman or two somewhere whom he could charm if he wished to. It is the spirit of masculine vanity that forms the material upon which the adventurous may work. With the art of an expert, she sizes up the dimensions of her victim's vanity the instant she has made his acquaintance, and plays upon it to just the extent she deems expedient and profitable. If it were not for masculine vanity, the American adventurous do not exist. This is not a formal level, let me just say. This, that line is one of the reasons why I'm convinced it's written by a woman. Because <laughs> there's no, no attitude in this chapter that it's the irresistibility of women that is the issue, the sort of moralizing about you know, women as temptresses. This is like, no, men are chumps. It's the point. Women are smart. Women are smart. Suppose, for instance, that Mr. John Smith, who is a merchant in, in comfortable circumstances at home, and quite a great man in his town, is taking a stroll down State Street in the bright afternoon sunshine. He has just gotten outside after a good dinner at his hotel, prior to which he had a good shave and a cocktail, just the combination to make the well-to-do traveler, traveler with a little time on his hands feel literally out of sight. Out of sight. It might seem that uh, some 1960s slang traveled back in time in 1892, but the term actually dates to the 19th century and appears in Stephen Crane's Maggie Girl in the Streets, 1893. It might also signify the male, that the male traveler felt able to indulge in flirtation with random women met on the street because he's literally out of the sight of anyone from his hometown. Out of sight, as the slang phrase goes. <laughs> Suppose then, as John passes Marshall Field, he observes a magnificent creature, a royal blonde maybe, or a plump brunette. I never will do for the sake of illustration. Peeping shyly at him from beneath long silken lashes and smiling ever so slightly. Now, John may be a deacon in the church at home. He may even be the father of a large family. But if he is human and animated by the latent vanity that is the paramount trait of his sex, he will instantly experience a sensation of pleasure and attribute the strange beauty's attention to his own long dormant power to fascinate. That splendid creature, with her fine clothes, her exquisite complexion, and her graceful bearing, an adventurous? Impossible. At least to John, at least so John Smith thinks. She may even have a carriage at the curbstone into which she steps daintily, with her eyes still slyly following the amorous John. There is a delicate invitation in the glance, and if John is courageous, he will pshaw, and let us hope he won't, for it is a dead certainty that the coy beauty is an adventurous, the deadliest and most conscientious sort. John, who in his confiding soul has set her down as a duchess, or society queen at least, fondly imagines that it is his person of which she is enamored. We, who are better posted, know that it is his worldly wealth that she is after, and that even if she gives him an attack of palpitation of the heart by her warm glance, she is figuring on how she may most easily possess herself of that wealth. But the schemes of the sea's adventuresses are quite as numerous as those of the confidence man. A blackmail is their great card, and the one that they play most successfully. Blackmail. But this is not a separate note. The notes for this chapter tend to be one long thing, so I'm going to interrupt call. Blackmail would simply bow for him to expose a man's indiscretion to his family or business partners back home. As a rule, a prosperous citizen of good reputation and standing in his own town who misconducts himself when away from home would rather pay any sum in reason than have his friends at home know that their election. That is where the skilled adventuress makes her strong play. If she has the power to lure her victim into a liaison, she has surely had the tact to draw from him in the two or three days they have spent together all the particulars she needs as to his relations in his own town. What a disheartening shock it must be, must it not, to have this splendid creature who has vowed a thousand times to the doting John Smith that she loves him for himself alone, strike him on the morning of his projected departure for home for a cool thousand dollars in cash? Thousand dollars in cash would be about twenty-four thousand dollars. Of course, he demurs, but when she pleasantly thinks of the trip she intends to make to his town, an exposure that must necessarily follow, what is to be done? Poor John Smith! He is not such a gay dog now. Uh, it gradually ends in a compromise of some sort, for the lady is seldom too exacting. If John is inclined to be docile, the extent of four and five hundred, maybe, she will probably be very good-natured and let it go with that. And allow me to interrupt here to point out uh, one of the great things about this book, in both its original and in the uh, edition that Northwestern University Press has created, is that it has really cool illustrations. If we had a slideshow set up, we could have put some up on the board. 
but uh, this illustration here shows the adventurer is sitting quietly in the saloon, and there's two guys, one of whom's kind of a dummy. You can tell he's kind of dumb because he doesn't know how to hold his uh, gloves and his cane while he's having a drink. He's got a cane between his legs and his gloves all over the place. Don't you keep your cane. Yeah, don't hold your cane like that. And, uh, and uh, meanwhile, the guy who look, looks really sharp is, you know, eyeing the lady who's sitting along the side. Uh, but more importantly, I want to emphasize that uh, the book is so, this book, our edition from Northwestern, is so beautiful and so well done because our designer, Mary Ann Jankowski, is sitting right down here in front, um, put together and managed to like, incorporate all of the illustrations from the original text into this modern text. And it's not an easy thing to pull off because some of them were you know, put in in really awkward kind of ways um, like this, like covering whole texts and, and so on. Um, and Mary just did a fabulous job with the cover of it. I'd also like to say, I ordered a quote from you a while ago, give it to her. <laughs> this is the highest type of adventurous, the aristocrat of her profession. For her, the types descend in grades down to the very lowest of all, the birds of the night, prowl the street in search of victims so they may lure to the dens of their male accomplishments. There to be vulgarly drugged or slugged and robbed of their portable valuables. Don't be shy, buddy. So, um, interactive reading. Right. This, yeah, this particular uh, way that the female, the adventures of work with is uh, commonly known as the badger game. It involves a fake husband or other outraged man demanding satisfaction for his dishonor. Um, see Nelson Ogden's design for departure in the end wilderness for a story about a couple playing the badger game. All right. The indignant husband game is a favorite one with adventuresses of the second class, by which term is signified such fair and failed creatures as occupy a somewhat lower place in the plane of rascaldom than the fairy who relies solely upon discreet blackmail without publicity for her means of support. This game is usually played upon very green persons for the reason that very few others would fall victim to it. The fair decoy makes the acquaintance of her quarry on the street, at a matinee or elsewhere. For the first interview, she is on her good behavior, and by her repression of any approach to familiarity that her newly acquired friend may make, she creates the impression that she's a very nice and decorous person indeed. Although disposed, dispossessed, or a eh, little disposed, disposed to flirt, that is all. <laughs> She does, however, write him to call upon her, and of course he does so. Perhaps today, perhaps tomorrow, but he calls anyway. By letting fall certain artful hints, she contrives to let her victim know that she is a married woman. This, of course, lends an added spice of interest to the adventure. The idea of poaching on forbidden ground is attractive to the Duke. So an hour passes in pleasant converse, and in the natural course of events, the caller becomes sentimental. This much accomplished, he is hers, so to speak. At the very moment that the poor victim is congratulating himself upon his conquest, there's a thundering knock at the door. My God, screams the lady with the dramatic intensity of a burnt heart, my husband. <laughs> the startled fly in her net squirms in his seat. Who would not, situate as he is? What is to be done, he asks weakly. Hide, hide, says the poor wife. <laughs> in quotation, in quotation. Straight away rushes him into a convenient closet. Uh, the husband enters and, singularly enough, finds no difficulty in discovering the interloper's hiding place. He is gruffly ordered to come out, and, as, as like as not, finds himself looking down the barrel of a big revolver. Of course, he is willing to make any sort of sense of settlement in order to escape with the whole skin. If he has no currency, the husband's wounded honor will be healed with a check, although he would rather have his watch, seeing that the payment of checks can easily be stopped at the bank. <laughs> Now it must not be inferred from the foregoing that any peaceable gentleman who walks the streets is liable to be dragged by the nape of his neck into a compromising situation and compelled to disgorge all of his portable wealth at the point of a pistol. Far from it. He who walks the straight path of virtue is in no danger whatsoever. It is your frisky gentleman who is out for a little lark and is reckless in his manner of carrying out the enterprise who is likely to find himself in his snare. Be good and you will be happy is a maxim, modern honest, that applies very handsomely to this sort of thing. But you will miss a lot of fun, the frisky man waves. <laughs> well, well, even so, but be very careful, for you know not how soon or how abruptly the languishing angel at your side may change into a fiery inheritance, determined to have your money, your reputation, or your life, whichever may suit her best. 
only a shade removed from the indignant husband game is the old Hanno Enterprise. The Hanno Enterprise, or Hanno game, was more straightforward robbery, although the writer here neglects to mention this last ploy would not happen with the supposed dalliance, but during prostitution. Some brothels were constructed with rooms furnished with only a bed and a single chair. The man would leave his clothes on the chair, and as our author delicately puts it, while the interview between the more or less affectionate lovers is in progress, interview? The woman's compatriot would slide the panel back and steal the man's watch, money, and other valuables. The customer could not complain if he even noticed before leaving the establishment, because doing so would mean admitting that he'd patronized a prostitute, and the brothel would itself would have both paid off police protection and on site bouncers in any case. The old panel enterprise, which is so very vulgar and simple in the manner of its operation that it would not be worthy of mention were it not for the author's desire to warn strangers to every grade of intelligence against every possible danger that may lie in wait for him. Beware, O oh sportive young gentleman in search of a little diversion, of the young woman who on the shortest term of acquaintance invites you to accompany her to her flat or her boudoir, as the case may be. It may be that she has a pair of sharp scissors in her pocket with which she deftly snips off your money pocket. But failing this device, the panel is brought into play. While the interview between the more or less affectionate lovers is in progress, a panel in the wall slides back, pushed by invisible hands, and a third person, the male confederate of the damsel, slinks through it into the apartment. The amount of plunder he secures depends entirely upon the degree of absorption with which the quarry is wooing his charmer and the progress that he has made in her affections. But however that may be, he is tolerably certain to emerge a heavy loser. If the presence of the third party is discovered, and it is surprising how seldom this is the case, the fight is in order and the victim is fortunate if he escapes from only the loss of his valuables to more and no physical injury to lament. It is a sorry subject, and one is glad to leave it. Before doing so, however, remember one thing, and remember it very distinctly. No young lady, however irreproachable her appearance, who enters into a street flirtation, can safely be regarded as other than dangerous. Act on this suggestion and you will run no risks. In other words, be good and you will be happy. A repetition of the maxim will do no harm. Q&A now, we'll take a quick break, and then do Q&A, and then we read another section. Democracy doesn't work, I realize, I should probably not say that. We'll take a 10-minute break now, do Q&A, and then read one more session. So 10 minutes for food. Uh,